uh, we've got a um, a uh, pair of RCA outputs at, at, uh, coming out of here. Is it possible to get those into the uh, big speakers at some point during this? If it's hard, don't worry about it. All right, yeah, well, forget it. We'll forget it then. All right. Hey, my name is Trick. Um, we're going to give a demo of some work that I've been playing around for the last couple months in a system called Croquet. Croquet is built on Squeak, which is an implementation of Smalltalk. So everything you see today is going to be happening in Smalltalk, where all of the source code is available to you. It's all implemented as objects. It's all easy to go in and switch and change anything if there's things about the user interface you don't like, the rendering you don't like. This is cool that it's, it's all open. We're going to start out with the demo that ordinarily would be at the end of the talk. And the reason we're doing that is because it took us you know, 10 minutes to get everything plugged in together. And uh, is everybody at the, at the level of the cue pot? Okay. Um, this rabbit is my rabbit, and it's on this screen here. And all the others I'm hoping you can see over people's shoulders. And if you can't, feel free to move around. There's no reason to sit still politely during this. This is a more of an active kind of a, a talk we're going to be doing. So get where you can see what's going on. Let's uh, go ahead, and I'm going to go down to this bottom corner. There's a dock. It's got some tools in it. And the tool that I want is T-Connection Dialog. And let's get everybody to this level. Eventually, you won't have to do this much synchronization to get things together, but this is a developer-only release named 0.3. It's called the Jasmine release of Croquet. And uh, we all ready? All right, let's do it then. Connect. And um, we're going to try not to do much, but maybe wiggle our ears once every, uh, once every 10 seconds so that we can see when other people start popping up in about the same place. Uh, it's not real robust right now. If we start moving around a lot, it's going to send a lot of events across the network to each other, and it gets clogged, and they tend to crash. So we'll be a little careful at this beginning point. And I'm going to tilt my ears, and I don't see anybody else on my screen yet. Uh, the, the lights on the, the little hub down here are going crazy, so stuff is going on. I've already got one little error. They're working on these things. They've gotten a lot better. Target is nil. Target is nil refers to um, I've got the ID of an object that's not on my system yet. And the networking is kind of a kludge right now. There's uh, David Reed and David Smith are working on a, a new implementation of it, and I hear that it's almost ready. USLA, the Object-Oriented Systems Languages Applications Conference, was last weekend in San Diego. And wow, wow, I think we're there. Okay, I'm going to step forward first, and I'm going to turn around and look back at the crowd. And when I get back around, maybe Joan can step out next. All right, Greg and Ryan and um, Isaac, yes, yes, okay. So we're all there. That's cool. So now we can just go out and play. Um, there's a, those uh, carpets standing there and this cannon in this corner that I'm going to right now are stuff that I wrote. And I'll show you the code for it a little later on. And any one of us can click on that gold box and it starts the simulation. That's a cannon. And a ball is coming out every 1.3 seconds. And there will be up to 99 cannonballs, and then it will start to recycle. They'll turn black right before they recycle. And recycling is something I did because uh, the dictionary that maps global IDs of objects to the, your local copy of the object 
doesn't clean itself too well if you uh, cycle through a whole lot of objects. Who's doing something interesting? People moving carpets around. Uh, yeah, you see the laser. There's a little laser next to me right here, and that's what I would manipulate things with. And the way these carpets move is, is kind of my own code. I, I tweaked up some other stuff. I can move them left and right, and I can move them up and down. But I can't move it in and out towards me. It's just a flaw in the, the user interface. What I would have to do is I would have to run around to the side of it if I wanted to uh, get it to move the other way. And I wrote this because I, I kind of got inspired by trying to write a Quidditch game. And I know there's already like a commercial Quidditch game out there or something, the, the Harry Potter flying football game. But um, this is about as far as I got after two or three weeks of study and reverse engineering and figuring out what, what goes on inside of it. I'll show you a little more about the interface. Um, you see my uh, pointer in the very middle and there's a yellow cross. The right button moves me and if the arrow is above the cross, I move frontwards. If it's below, I move backwards. It's a little bit sluggish. And left and right. And this is different from what video game players want, where they want the uh, WASD kind of keys to, to do your motion. We've actually got another version of Croquet in which those keys do function the way they want. Uh, you've already seen the dock down in the bottom. There's a bunch of tools and different things down here. I'll paint you a, a fish or a yak or something with a tea painter and create a, a brand new mesh out of it. This gets you into, it says projects, um, other things you can do in small talk besides croquet. Someone's instantiating a helicopter. Um, snapshots lets you remember places that you've been. I don't think we have any snapshots yet. Um, tools, yeah, that was the painter. The browser, I'll show you that browser. That, that's a good one. And then Alice was a um, research project, I don't know, five, ten years ago where they and it got ported to several different platforms, and it was doing 3D things. And all those widgets have been included here. Then with the left button, which you usually use to manipulate things, if I click on the, there's the background back here. Oh, who spun that? Let me see if I can catch it. Okay. That was a bad joke. I didn't know you could even do that. All right. I caught it. Let me spin it around very carefully. The sidewalls of a... 2D portal, this is a 2D portal, uh, let you rotate like that. That seems to be a missed feature. I'm being hit by cannonballs right now, which is why I keep jumping up and down in the air. <laughs> I seem to be at a, a dangerous place. The balls will actually hit me and move me, and I didn't know that was going to work, but it just worked. Uh, I didn't have to write any code for that. What I'm going to do first is I'm going to instantiate a new space with that tool. These are not labeled. One of the things they've tried to do is do everything in a, a real 3D kind of way instead of having text and menus and things. Uh, a lot of people don't like that. Other people are working on having menus and, and WASD kind of navigation and, and, and the old world kind of way of doing things. The hand, this is a halo at the top, and when my mouse is up near the top of the bar, if I quit getting hit by cannonballs, Okay, I'm going to have to maneuver my way back over to it again. Um, a halo comes up, and there's five things, and the X will close it. That'll take a snapshot. That seems to be a little weird right now. This will position me front and center to it. That will let me grab it, and wherever I go, like I'm going to push this back out of the way a little bit and ungrab it. So it moved with me, and I ungrab it, and I'm going to stretch it out to be a whole lot bigger. The balls are not going to go through this. Somebody already stepped through this portal that I made and is standing in the new space over there. And uh, so these, these two, sp <laughs> two people have gone through this portal while I've been talking, being hit by cannonballs. Okay, everybody's over there except for me. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take a gift with me when I go through there. And what I'm going to do is use this, and that's a 3D portal. This is a little 3D model of the entire... I don't need those things, of the entire world. I'm going to try to position it a little bit better there. And I can tilt it down. Not of the entire world, just of my space. But you can see me right, ex right there talking to this portal, sort of. 
and all the simulations going around me. There's those red cannonballs that were probably hitting me. And I'm going to take this thing by the hand and going to take it with me into this other space so that while they're over here in this boring, barren land, I hope somebody's created a banana or a Charizard or something over here yet, but I will uh, drop this off now. And so everybody can see someone's moving it around already. They put it inside of me. Thanks. <laughs> and it's spinning around to the point. If I click on that top bar, I can usually stop it from spinning when they leave it spinning like that. Gazebo, huh? There's a gazebo, yeah. Okay, let's, not, let's try not to create things we haven't created before. Because there are some things in here that have so many triangles in their meshes that a couple of these machines will drop out. And once a machine drops out, it's a little flaky still. So you're starting to get the idea that uh, there's a lot of creative stuff that can be done. And uh, a lot of stuff already works. And the way these things combine together is surprising. I'm still learning things to do. About, huh? How do you stop it from spinning? Uh, Left click on the top bar of it, which the center of the top bar is kind of stable. You should be able to get it, even though you can't get the sides of it because they're spinning around so fast. Now, there's the banana. Oh, this is a good chance to show, um, to show the T-Space browser tool down here. This is small talk, and you can change. Yeah. We're going to show some more pretty stuff, then we'll get to that. Um, I, 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 it's going to get in 10 minutes. You're, you're, you're on the right track. Tools. Uh, browser. There we go. Smalltalk is, is infamous for having these browsers. Smalltalk used GUIs before GUIs were coo cool. Back in the 1970s, Smalltalk, everything in it was visual and, and used GUIs. And Smalltalk was object-oriented and still is like one of the purest object-oriented languages out there. This space contains... And one of the guys who's funding this whole thing. There's 12 people working on croquet right now. And that's a really lucky thing for a, a, a useless project with no practical applications like this to have 12 people. I mean, a lot of startup companies would love to have the kind of capital to, 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 to waste 12 people's really, really brilliant computer scientist time on it. One of the guys behind it is Alan Kay, who um, coined the term object-oriented programming, by the way, and was instrumental in creating this second version Okay, that says a laser and a T-ray. I want to find the banana. There's the banana. And if I right-click in between there twice, I can get an inspector on the banana. And I'm going to color it black. Caps lock. Wow. Caps lock. Color eyes. Color black as V3D color. And then my right click in here will be able to say, do it. Is someone correcting me? What, what did I miss? Yeah, you know what I'm actually missing? I want it to turn uh, black on everybody's screen. I should say meta. Meta is a, is a weird message that um, gets trapped. It's not implemented by any objects, and so it gets trapped. So self-meta colorize. That's what I want. And uh, gets sent to everybody else's computer. This is how you write code that uh, executes on all, all the nodes. Do it. And I know that as B3D color, I didn't get the case right. And I couldn't remember what the case is, but this kind of has a do what I mean feature that pops that up and lets you correct it. And the banana turned black. So we've, we've not just changed a variable at runtime. We've sent a, a message, and we've sent a message across the whole network just using the little tools that are built into Smalltalk. And a little later on, uh, Ryan fixed a bug in this whole system. And if we have time, he can show you how that bug fix, and that will show you more browsers and things. We're only 11 minutes after 6, so we will actually have time to do a lot of stuff. That's good. Um, the 
donut up here is supposed to look like a halo. It gives you access to what's called the morphic halo. This makes a thing go away. This iconifies it. This has menus that let you do things like um, show the frame rate. Now my frame rate is appearing up here. You can't see it. It says uh, 21 frames per second, 3 frames, 25, 8. It's all over the map. Some of that is just small talk garbage collection, and some of it is people sending messages around as they're doing things. I don't need that anymore. What about memory management? Garbage, garbage collection and small talk, yeah. And we're still pushing the banana around. Oh, look at there. Um, that's a 3D. I'm sorry, that's a, that's a wireframe. Why is that looking like that? That's a wireframe portal placed in front. Thank you, Ryan. A wireframe portal placed in front of the portal that goes back to the other world, or what, what, what's behind there? Yeah, okay. It's two different portals. Even though I'm dragging it around, it looks like the other thing is, is right through it. And as I go through a wireframe portal that gives you like this wireframe vision where textures don't render, uh, when I go through it again, I'm going to have a toggling effect, and let's see what happens. I don't even know what's going to happen. This is beyond me. Um, I think I'm going to see it normally again, but maybe everything else, uh, we pushed it too far. Yeah, like I'm totally in wireframe mode now, and I can create another wireframe portal, which is, is it this one, Ryan? Yeah. And if I step through it, things will become normal again. Yeah, I think that worked. Why is that so weird still? Okay. All right, we've done uh, this one, create a new space. This one creates a, uh, a 3D portal. Someone put this carpet on me. Let's move it away. And uh, that one is the, uh, the wireframe vision. This one, never, never push this while you're connected to other people. It crashes. And what it does is it pops up a, a 2D portal with just a small talk browser inside of it. I can show you that later on when we're not worried about being connected. Eventually, I won't care if we break everything and, and we lose all these people in this one big session. Yeah, you're already lost. Okay. Well, that's nice that you dropped out. That's probably why I, that's why I had a timeout message then. Yeah, because you're node timed out. This is a weird one. I'm not going to do it right now. Um, Someone has slid, okay, control A changes my camera angle. I'm going to move my camera angle back so you can see. Someone has slid a carpet underneath me and lifted that carpet up, and that moved me. Um, we, we keep finding new things that work. The telephone over here is so that we have a conference call. Now, none of us are trying audio right now. I don't know if anybody's got it on by default, but if we had headphones on and we're at different places on the planet, we would be able to hear each other as a conference call. It's using OpenGL for the graphics and OpenAL for 3D audio. And I've got an uh, OpenAL uh, helicopter in here to, to show you later on. And that's what I wanted to actually put on the big speakers and, and hear it. But it looks like we're not going to be able to do that. You can see what a sphere sounds like, yeah. And it even does Doppler. And OpenAL is, audio library is immature compared to OpenGL. I mean, OpenGL is what, what all this stuff is running on flawlessly right now. You have to have a version 1.3 um, of OpenGL. And it really helps to have a, a, a good 3D graphics card. I've got an NVIDIA GeForce FX, Ryan 5200, in this box. And this box that I'm demoing you with is only an Athlon 1200 megahertz. So it could be twice as fast if I bought a new machine today. So I'm, I'm not using the, the latest stuff by any means. Why doesn't this go away? X. I think we've maybe had enough fun here, and I'm going to drop out of this world. Some of them may stay in it. And um, we need to get on to Virgil's question. Why, why, why is this compelling or interesting? Um, Alan Kay, the guy who coined object-oriented programming and helped create the GUI, these same guys, I mean, that's two of the most successful things out of, out of, out of programming, you know, that, that's 
very popular today. I mean, everybody thinks of Java as being object oriented, and and Windows as as being the the kind of canonical GUI of today. But they they make the comment that the biggest advance from 1970 to the latest thing by Microsoft, as far as the the, the user interface goes, is it has color. It hadn't changed, and. They're saying we have fast enough CPUs now and good enough graphics cards that are just being wasted unless you're playing video games. Let's try to redesign the user interface to be 3D. And it's kind of the, the user interface for the next 30 years instead of the past 30 years is what one of the things this research project is about. And they're interested in a collaborative education, teaching kids how to program, um, teaching anybody how to how to do stuff with computers. That's kind of what's driving them behind this. What do I want it for? I've got the problem that I'm spending about a month in California and a month in the southeast, which is sometimes Augusta, sometimes Atlanta, sometimes Tennessee, traveling around. And I would like to be able to sit around the dinner table at night and have all my friends around and be able to talk and uh Pair program, work on code together, or just design stuff, or just chat about stuff. And we've got a variety of technologies that do it now. You get on AIM. That's what everybody does. You know, uh, five, ten years ago, it was IRC, is what all the hackers used. And it's, it's sad that on AIM, everybody's talking to like individuals instead of making communities and groups and, and talking to groups of people. So um, we've got blogs and wikis and discussion lists and stuff, and I'm toying around with the idea of bringing that all together into this kind of a brand new environment is what I'm, what I'm interested in. Virgil, what do you want? Yeah, Virgil says a wiki would be nice if you had a group of people that wanted to present information about a project and share it with each other and with the world. Yeah, you can come in and see each other's changes. And um, that's something that I've gotten real interested in. The, the last thing I'm going to show you is a Citrus Gallery. And me and Ryan have been playing around with the idea of how would you make a wiki out of this Citrus Gallery software. And I'll show you that at the end. Yes? One of the things that I liked when I read through was that you could run applications and have multiple people watch it. So you could put your PowerPoint up, and next year nobody has to come to Freak Nick. Well, we like coming, but... Uh, you know, you can go and have your presentation, and everybody can be wherever they're at, and, you know, you can kind of collaborate yourself into an audience and have someone speak and talk and have their PowerPoint up. And I just thought that was kind of an interesting uh, interesting project you could do with it. Yeah, and uh, when, I f when I first started planning this, I thought I was going to do slides, like PowerPoint slides. And uh, I actually came up with this idea of... Um, having my first slide on the screen, you don't know it's not PowerPoint. And then I back up from it, and I've gone through a portal, and you see my second slide, and you start to realize something else is going on. And then I back up a little bit more, and I back up onto an escalator that takes me up to the top of a spiral walkway that looks like the Guggenheim, and it's got portals placed along the way with all my uh, slides, and I, and I walk around and, and talk about it. But um, I decided to try this totally differently where we, we're actually doing things and talking instead of looking at slides because that's a whole lot more fun with this environment. I'm going to bail out of this environment at this point, and we'll show you some other stuff that people have done with this. Uh, we do have a Charizard. Hooray. Okay. Uh, toggle full screen. Notice I went to the... Um, the, the morphic halo. This, this is, now we're back to where it looks more like small talk. And feature of small talk in the, in the squeak implementation is this halo that goes around things. Where's my halo? Have I frozen? Yeah, we're all frozen. Okay. I'm going to um, now run a teapot. And that will take about a minute or a minute and a half to start up. And if anybody else wants to run a teapot or to run something else or join together on a network, I'm going to stay off of your network for now so that it doesn't slow me down. But you're welcome to. Actually, y'all should do that. Do, do teapot instead of Q-pot. 
Q-Pot was the Quidditch game. Teapot is there. Um, all right, this is Alan Kay that I kept mentioning. He's the one of the six principles that I know. All their faces will be coming up. When you um, drag the teapot off of this green palette of objects, um, you get a, uh, a picture of all, all six of the people behind it. I believe that's either David Smith or David Reed. I, I, I matched them up to the names once, but I, I'm not too good with it. Uh, what you've seen in the middle is a portal that opens back onto itself, and it turns into a mirror. So you can actually see my, my entire rabbit down inside of that mirror. There's a pyramid here. If you uh, hover over the pyramid with the mouse and you hit a key from two to six, it turns into Sierpinski's pyramid. I'll do that. Do it, yeah. I have to wait for the clouds to come. Um, no, nothing will really work yet until the, uh, the the sky gets textured with clouds and they start moving. Oh, we got clouds. Okay. All right. We'll go see the we'll go see the pyramid first. the The pyramid is wrapped by a uh, T spinner, and T spinner lets you twirl things around. And if you give it a twirl and let it go, it keeps twirling, which is what they were doing to um, the 2D portals. Let me get the point back up top. That yeah, that looks more right. And uh, now I hit two, and I hit three, and I hit four. Let me change my camera. Why didn't Control A work? Have I lost focus? That's going to be bad if I've lost. Yeah, uh, my keyboard focus has been lost somewhere. And that actually looks really weird. Yeah, I guess that's right. Oh, hold on. Let me go uh, five, six, seven. Wow, it goes up to seven. I don't think it goes beyond seven, eight. Yeah. Do what? Okay. And then I can kind of step through it. Uh, I can step on it. It's solid, so I... Uh, yeah, you, you saw myself inside of it for a moment there. Now what am I on? I'm on that clock. And I can't go Control-A. Oh, Control-A is back. How about that? Oh, Control-R is a rearview mirror, so I can see what's behind me with, with that up there. And... Okay, as far as a shared application, the, the kind of example that's in here now is behind this guy's face. His portal is closed right now. I can either click on the plus or just click on his face and it'll open up. The uh, arrow is a shortcut to move me rapidly so it's front and center like that. And then I can uh, step through it. And what's in here? Okay, there's the portal I came in in my, in my rearview mirror. That's a little distraction. I'm, I'm turning off the rearview mirror. And let's step up to this so you can actually see what's in there. And there's a whole bunch of numbers, and they're between 1 and minus 1. If I click on one of them, it uh, builds a little... Th here's point 0.9. That should stick out in blue, but you can't tell it's sticking out because I am... Um, and I can't do it there. That'll start to make a little bit of sense. You can see that it's... um showing me positive and negative by red and green, and they're sticking out in different ways. And if I change one of these numbers, like uh, this one, and I'm going to make it uh, something pretty big, like 30, and render that row, it's sticking way out. And there's a hot spot down in here that'll convert the whole thing to 3D rendering, and turn it around. You can see the one that I made 30. All the rest are between 1 and minus 1. And it can spin around like a lighthouse. And we can even leave it there. And we don't care that it's spinning because once I go back through this portal and close the portal, it's not going to slow anything down because it won't be available. Let me turn around. Um, yeah, the simulation, in effect, will still be spinning even if, um, even if uh, no one's viewing it. I think it might, yeah. Um, but uh, rendering is by far the more expensive operation. So, yeah. Come to think of it, let's go ahead and um, you stop spinning, turn back around. I can, you notice I'm manipulating it through a portal and make it go away. Stop. Hit that X. Go away. All right. 
That solves that. I can make the portal go away. We make the mistake sometimes. Uh, we'll have two different spaces connected by portals, and we'll accidentally or, or on purpose uh, close the portals from both ends, and that'll leave like me and Ryan in completely different worlds, and we we don't have any way to get back to each other right now. Um, here's here's a cool effect when you when you ripple this guy's things it ripples in 3Ds that's made out of water or something like that that's kind of gratuitous fun let's see what's in these other ones that's the fish world the fish world uh, that's, a, that's a good thing to visit um, this is an example of trying to teach people how to make their own 3D objects and do their own program you see my avatar is turned into a fish and there's other fish swimming around there's, they've kind of got a little algorithm they're looking for a light or, or something like that and there's a, there's a sign floating here that tells you how to make your own fish. And what it tells you to do is this. Uh, go into tools and get this tea painter. And we're actually going to click on that and tell it that this is going to be the forward direction. And drawing a real simple fish tends to be the best thing at first. And it shows you kind of best how, how the rendering thing works. So I'll just... Uh, Give him a little fin, legs. <laughs> no anatomical parts. Okay. Um, and let's make his insides yellow because that shows up pretty well. We get the paint bucket, put yellow, yellow, yellow. And then for his eye, something bright red. Okay. And he's a keeper. So I keep him. It's going to take a few seconds to inflate him and render him as a mesh. And a tricky thing about this is, from where I'm standing when I'm front and center with this thing, there's his feet sticking out from behind. Uh, you can make your fish and then not even know that he's there because he shows up on the back side of that. But there's my fish. Um, I can't rotate him. I can rotate myself, though. Let me come around. What about what? Uh, not on this one. This one has a T-dragger instead of a T-spinner. I can, I can do shift and lift him upwards more. But let me try again to look at him end on end. Now that's weird. That had some strange effects. It's It's... Slightly inflated into 3D, but it, it started with a 2D source. So you can see that the center of it got, got pretty bulbous, but the edges are, are thin. So it's actually pretty cool what, whatever algorithm they use to uh, turn your 2D drawing into a 3D fish. It's, uh, yeah, it's drawn as a bitmap, and then it's, where did my fish go? And then it's rendered as a mesh. There's a bunch of triangles. And over here's another one that says how to make your fish swim. And unfortunately, uh, it doesn't tell you how to make the fish swim. Fish does not swim. Um, but you can get a hint how the fish would swim if you look at other scripting projects in Croquet, like you'll find out here. In this, uh, there's a bunch of uh, scripting things where there's buttons that do stuff. In fact, I, I, the one of those is, is actually represented in here. I can go find it. Um, uh, fish world, close up. You're taking too much time. More interesting, let's go to Mars. There's a, there's a Mars rover in here that's a pretty neat gadget. And I think it's just beautiful how they've, how they've rendered Mars. You know what, I've been doing all this without stretching my... Um, yeah, let, me, let me go full screen. Somebody say full screen next time. Yeah, okay. That's, that, that's better. Uh, I just like the texture of the Mars rocks and the there's a sunscape somewhere's setting and some of it looks a little kludgy. There's a rock in my way. I jump over it. And I want to be on this uh, toy right here. Oh, toy scooter or something that we've been sending to Mars. And if you hover over it and you type F, you start moving forward. 
and L will make me turn to the left. And look at the wheels, how they move independently as we uh, bounce over the, the train of Mars. Maybe it's not showing up so well right now. Let's go a little faster. Yeah, I must go faster. And I'm about to bounce off of it, I'm afraid. I'm just barely holding on. I fell off. Oh, well, it happens. And it's going in a circle. I don't really know how to stop it. Yeah. Let's see if I can find my way home. There it is. Just for the demo, here's the other way home. You go down to the um, the dock and where you have snapshots. In this world, they've they've pre-took snapshots. Come back up in a lot of different places. These snapshots come to life once they get big. See, the, the Earth starts turning now. Now we've got an actual camera into where that snapshot goes to. Like, let's go there. But at first it came up with a little static um, image, and there's my portal that will get me home somehow. That's kind of pretty. I'm going to take the, this is back to the, the old world where the thing was, and close this portal. Make him go better. And this guy? Are you the dungeon? Yeah, this is the dungeon. June, you want to come drive? Yeah, yeah, you, you, you're, you're good in this space. It'll let me talk more. There's a ray at the bottom of my rabbit that's looking downwards, and it's looking for things that are solid. The floor here is solid. That pyramid is solid because if I climb on it, I jump up over it, and there's a bit that you can set or not set on things that tell whether they're solid. And actually, since it's small talk, it's a message that you send. This is kind of the most uh, artistic of the default worlds that are built in. The, the spreadsheet showed you like the idea that you could collaboratively be editing something. The, the Mars thing was kind of a simulation. It showed you can visualize how, how things run. This one's just for fun. There's a waterfall. There, we we're getting a glimpse of the waterfall over to the left. Yeah, and this, this tree, it's possible to, to climb up, but it's a little... The last couple of days, trees have not been very climbable. Oh, you're, you're part way up it, are you? You was, yeah. That, that, yeah, that's why the, the, the camera had moved up is because we had climbed up a few branches, but it's a little tricky to... Look at that. We can go right through that wall. Um, when we get to the citrus galleries at the end, there are these art galleries. They've got walls that you can't go through, and that was kind of nice to see because just about everything else here, we can, we can go through these walls. I wonder why it's moving so slow. Close, close that portal while we're going by. That should speed things up some. Okay. It helps a little bit. I, I don't know why it's so sluggish. Ryan says it's doing what? Because it's going to two different monitors. Does that take uh, NVIDIA longer to, to render on both monitors, even if they're in twin clone mode? Okay, yeah, that might be. What, what, what I've kind of found, though, is usually the, the limiting factor is the small talk, not the NVIDIA card. Like, gamers will tell me, oh, you can do a lot more triangles than that. So this is kind of neat. They've gone to a little trouble here to paste together a lot of stuff. When you look behind the scenes, it's, you're, you're at the, the edge of things where it's kind of kludged together. I don't think she's supposed to be able to jump up there. But Every time we do this, we find something new that you can do. And it's not something that they've programmed. It just works. Once you get all the, the pieces together, it just works. Is there a physics engine? No, not really. The, the physics engine is just the small talk code that we've written and it's a little ad hoc, but the physics of the avatars looking for solid things beneath them and climbing up and down, that's done kind of automatically. But if you, in, if you derive your own avatar, you could replace all that with something else. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's, it's, not, it's not real sophisticated as far as like when I, when I wrote those cannonballs, I wrote all my own physics to figure out what their reflection off the carpets would be and what the next um, carpet they're going to bounce off of is going to be. And actually, we've got bugs because I haven't done a great job of that. Where are you? Outside. She's way outside. <laughs> okay. <laughs> go back. Did you? Go, 
Yeah, go back through and, and, and jump off the end of that uh, bridge down into the waterfall below and bask in the, in the particle object. Any other questions I should answer while I'm... Um, there's some options on the lighting. Um, I believe in this world there's just a real simple light up above, but it's not doing shadows. We don't have shadows yet. And each object defines whether it wants OpenGL to do its shading or not. Part of their philosophy behind this is that in the, in the small talk code for each of the primitive kinds of objects, there's a render method that gets called, and that makes calls on OpenGL. And you've got full access to OpenGL to do your own stuff. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you, you, you can use 3D modeling tools to build your own models and incorporate together. I think there's only one kind of format that you can, maybe one or two formats that you can input into this. When we get to the Citrus Gallery, they're using a different three-letter extension than appears in these worlds, and so a different set of people had a different tool. It's really immature right now as far as in incorporating things from, like I wish, you know, Blender 3D. I, I played with that about a month ago, but I started to realize that I probably would not be able to interpolate things in unless I wrote some stuff. Okay, we're going to jump off the end now. I played with this for a month before I ever thought of like walking way up here or climbing up the hill. I thought it was just pretty scenery. And there's the, the particle waterfall going on. Another question over here? Yeah, when I was looking at the spreadsheet, there was a bunch of data there, and it looked pretty obvious that it was just generated with some simple sines and cosines or something, but how would you get data into these worlds? Uh, you've got all of Smalltalk, so you can open a file, you can parse it, you can read it. You've got full access to the operating system. And this is the part of the reason I'm presenting this to hackers. Um, it does not have a security model yet. And they're talking about stuff, and they're pointing to some academic papers, and there's the second version of a... a security programming language called E. Well, the first one was really addressed at security. It came shortly after Java. It was by Electric Communities, I think, which are like good hackers, cypherpunks, basically, were writing it. And there's a new version of it, and these guys are referencing that for some security attributes. There's another guy who's, uh, his name is Ian. He's in France. He's writing a new version of the Smalltalk virtual machine. He's the guy that actually ported this small talk or this squeak virtual machine from Macintosh where it was developed to, to Unix, and he's kind of like done porting. So, uh, and and his, his web page says, I've been building virtual machines for 14 years. He's working on a new one that we think is going to be about five times faster, and if we do some fundamental things differently, I think you can get more security out of it, more stronger kind of sandboxes. But small talk, um, like a lot of things that were created in the 1970s, wasn't really uh, thinking very strongly about security and sandboxes and things. And uh, maybe this is something I can contribute to the group because I've been really concerned. We're on a private network right here. Anybody could send probably a message to a uh, operating system object that has an argument of exec rm-rf blah, 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 and it would be bad. Yeah. Let me, let me give you the mic. I don't think I'll be able to summarize it. Just in response to his question about how you can interact with an actual app, I was talking to Mark Guzdal at Georgia Tech, and he told me that there was an X11 server built for Croquet within Squeak. So you can actually inter interface with a Linux app. You don't have to use just stuff that's written in Squeak if you want to do that. Okay, that, that's, that's right. Um, I've also seen some... Uh, Readmes or something that says it doesn't really work on any platform very reliably right now. And even the things where the contents of the 2D uh, frames go to um, one of those two in the very back there. Yeah, there's two in the back. One of them has the e-toy world where there's a little car that's been scripted for a steering wheel to control it and you try to steer it around a track. It's just a classic thing that I always demo and squeak. That's on the left one. Yeah, let's do that one. Use the plus, and, or use the arrow and get up there. Uh, control A a couple times because your, your camera's so far behind your avatar that uh, 
We'd like to be up right at it. Control A, does it not work? Yeah, okay. Yeah, I didn't think about um, it slowing down because I had two different screens going on. We've still gone. <laughs> We've still gone through it. Control A twice more. Once I'll put the camera, huh? Once I'll put the camera at his ears. Yeah, don't don't go through it. That's fine. You're you're doing great. <laughs> I mean, dude, it, it 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 helps a lot to have you. Um, yeah, if you put the arrow on the on the equator, then you then you spin around without moving. Uh huh. But even these things, they have a problem. They steal your focus, and it's not very clean. Um, you've got your, your three different buttons, and which buttons are going to be sent to the thing inside of there, and which button is not. All right, see the stop, step, go, push, go, and the car starts moving. And that steering wheel, do a middle click on the steering wheel, and you'll get a halo. No, see, we can't turn that steering wheel very well because uh, we need a different click, and croquet is capturing that click. So there, there, there's the issues. Oh, we did get it. All right, the blue one on the left at 8 o'clock, 7 o'clock. See if you can ignore those for now. Yeah, that. That'll turn the steering wheel. Yeah, and it's an environment within an environment within an environment. You see, uh, the outer thing was morphic, the next thing was croquet, and now we're doing another morphic thing in there. So there's kind of layers of emulation and stuff going on. But uh, yeah, she's she's steering it. Um, yeah, this this it'd be nice if this could actually be an X terminal or an X server within croquet. Then your problem comes: how do you write? Uh, deterministic simulation so that every node um, calculates, so sort of calculates the simulation simultaneously. The way we've been working in the croquet game and in all these other things, only the user interactions are sent across the network. Everything else is just a simulation that's running locally. And this was a little challenge when I was writing my, my Quidditch game that I didn't want to violate. Um, the motions of the balls are all calculated locally. It's only the positioning of the carpets that is broadcast around in my Quidditch game. And um, everything is done in what's called tea time. Tea time is a pseudo time. There's three different times going on. There's real time that we see on our watches. There's the times on the, each different CPU, the, the CPU time. And then there's pseudo time in which you try not to have anti-causal paradoxes. So if I say the time right now is 10.30 and he sends me a message saying, I'm sending you this message at 10.35, I want to up my personal clock from 10.30 to 10.35 so that if I respond to that message, it doesn't look like I'm sending a response out at 10.31 to a message that came in at 10.35. You can, uh, you can have little violations of things as long as you don't have anti-causalities. And in addition to saying it's 10.35, I say it's 10.35 on node 1. And he said it was 10.35 on node 2. And I might actually have to make it 10.36 on node 1 so that that complete number is higher than 10.35 on node 2 because 2 is greater than 1, and I want to be sure that I'm not lagging behind in the past. So these kind of algorithms are what they're going towards. It's not completely there yet. Can, can you back out of this, or are we stuck in it? Hey, great. Okay, very cool. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I still don't have a good feel. Okay, this is a chess game. Yeah, <laughs> uh, Pawn to King 4. <laughs> good enough. Um, so the way I wrote the Quidditch game, when you move one of those carpets, it sends the, the motion like a twentieth of a second or a tenth of a second into the future. And it kind of tells all the other nodes, at this time, we're going to move this carpet here, or my avatar is going to turn his ears that way. And you kind of announce ahead of time what you're going to do about a tenth of a second from now so that everybody can be doing stuff. All these nodes collect all these messages, sort them in order, and when your pseudo time catches up to these events, then you simulate them. And the idea is to keep everything in sync across the nodes. It doesn't actually quite work right now. 
you notice that the avatars got hit by cannonballs like I was under fire here for a while. Um, those are actually being done at the frame redraw rate of going through the rendering routines and are different on each one. So um, Gregor might not see me being hit by the cannonball when, when Ryan does see me. And I myself see that I've been scooped up on a cannonball and I'm like surfing on it like a, like a skateboard. That's, a, that's an example of where the, the, the simulation has not been kept in sync. If you opened up, say, uh, uh, an email program or something and everybody was going to stand around and let's see what the email is today, how are they going to get the same simulations on their things? It's almost like we're back to having to copy the, um, the, the X screen back and forth. So there's, there's great problems here. And part of the reason I'm bringing this to you is uh, get your own ideas about cool things to do with it and, and, and pick a part of it to work on. Because we're lucky that 12 people right now are working on this full time. And that's not going to last forever. At some point, this kind of becomes the world. It's, it's open source, and either we carry it on or, or it's going to lag behind, and instead you're going to have nothing but commercial sites and commercial multi-user games, and, and we, we've lost this. Yes? I know that syncing games up is a common problem in any multiplayer game. Have you reverse engineered any other software out there to see how they're dealing with that issue? No, Try to kind of get. Yeah. I mean, that, I'm not sure how they do it. Yeah, I've I've never written a, a, a you know a graphical kind of video game before. I mean, I, I wrote things when I was a kid in Basic, you know, like 1970s kind of Basic. But uh, I'm coming into this cold as far as, you know, what OpenGL does. And I didn't know what a mesh was. I didn't know that everything was rendered out of triangles two months ago. So I've had a lot of fun reading this and learning this. And, and inventing the physics of Quidditch from first principles was, was kind of cool. Yeah. Do you see it staying as, uh, you know, where everybody's got to run their own local copy and, you know, everybody gets all the updates? Or do you see it moving more towards where there's going to be a server and everyone's going to log on and get their, you know, get their environment and keep it in sync with the server as opposed to everybody syncs with everybody? Um, it's going to be both. It's, it's built today on a peer-to-peer -peer architecture, and the idea for how would I in California join a, a connection that's already going, they talk about two different kinds of servers. There's a world-based server, and there's an interactivity server. And this is vapor today, but bits and pieces of it, you see it down in there. The world-based server is kind of the DNS. You have a name like, I want to uh, join the Yaks Lair. And you look up and you find out where the interactivity server or servers are. An interactivity server is a peer, just like all of these programs, except it's headless. It doesn't have a display, and it's running somewhere. And I think the idea is that those are going to have a database underneath them as a persistent store so that you can wake it up after a, a node crash and you've got a copy of things. That's not quite there yet. We've been waiting for a couple months for a, a big software update of the tea time stuff and, and these kind of things. They were hoping to have it by Oopsla one week ago, and I don't think they did. I think they demoed older stuff that, that worked because they ran into problems. And... But hopefully, you know, this, this fall, that, that will come out. Yes? Is this the successor to Vermal? Um, I think there's a lot of successors to Vermal. I don't see anybody, when, 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 when I look around at things and they have a list of what they import, I don't see Vermal actually being mentioned very much anymore. And uh, any, anybody good with this? But Vermal itself um, didn't have a language that could describe behavior and didn't have the notions of interactivity and different nodes that things are on. It just um, it would just give you a way to uh, describe one of these meshes or to describe a, something that you would see. So um, I think this is going to use whatever is the successor to Vermal in order to, to model things. I, I, uh, I was hoping this would be a, a mist-like kind of problem and that, you know, this question mark represented something that you had to figure out. Uh, there's nothing to figure out. It's just another cool space. Um, at this point, let's go into the citrus galleries, and I don't think you've seen that yet. I, I, I see I've got about, um, 
It's it's uh, 51 after the hour, so five or ten minutes left, and I'm going to try to do this. Any other questions while I'm doing it? Uh, oh, hold that. Huh? Hold that for me. What? Okay, so the next speaker is here. I'm going to, just so my X isn't fukered, defull screenitize and close this off. Oh, I've got a stack of CDs here. I've got about two dozen of them. And the Citrus Gallery is in a separate um, zip because they're so big. But um, I'm in a PN9. So where are they here? Croquet, PN9, Croak. Let me undo... Dot dot PN nine croak um, citrus galleries dot zip. Thanks. That's going to take a little bit. Uh, the two dot ten dot heavy is a uh, a big square space with four corners with bugs in one corner and dinosaurs in a corner and different art posted around it, and there's supposed to be some videos and things, and even that music, there's a, there's a mu music corner that doesn't seem to work. I'm going to go do that one first. So, croquet. I've added readmes and things to try to make this easier, and I've got a web page that, it, it, a wiki page that the, the address is down inside of there. It's uh, smileaxe.org slash 144. If you go to wiki.yak.net and look at recently changed pages, oh, I've got a sub. I already had done it. Why am I? Oh, I don't want them in the subdirectory. I want to move. You get stupid when you sit up on a stage with a microphone at your mouth. Yeah, Citrus Gallery 2.10.image. Thanks. Um, it says that some of this stuff is owned by other people, but you can use it for stuff. So uh, you can see, like, that's nicely rendered, very artsy, and it's got paintings on the wall, and there's a kind of a, I don't know, is that a Celtic kind of a knot thing? Now, when we get looking back towards the center, um, it knows there's lots of textures that it might have to display, and the occlusion starts to uh, render a lot of these textures and things slow down a bit. I think these bugs, I love that spider right there and the dragonfly. You know, These are little things that, that they would sell in Chinatown in San Francisco for uh, 5 or $10, or you could talk them down to about 3 But um, this is a movie, but a uh, movie does not play. It uh, pops up something about... Uh, but an MPEG file, audio channels, colon, and the MPEG file was null. Was it? Or it was supposed to be Boolean, but I think it was null. What would a debug on that say? We haven't actually showed you any small talk. There's your first small talk. Um, this is how I figured out how things work, is I went in and I... So self has audio, and what is self? Self is an MPEG file. Wow. Why can't that answer has audio? Answer asking it has audio sent back something that was not a boolean. What did it send back? Let's ask it to print it. Richard, where's the do it? There's no do it here. Try Alt P. Yeah, a byte array instead of a boolean. Why is it asking a byte array of false? Oh well, and we don't know. <laughs> so, uh, um. Yeah, I should, I should show you a little more of the Smalltalk browser. And I should show it another thing. Though. This is this is slowing down a lot. Let me show you one more gallery. Oh, these walls, by the way, are solid. If I try to run into it, I won't go through it. And I, I think that's kind of cool because I got so used to just walking through things that, uh, you know, stuff you shouldn't be able to do. I'm sorry? Cheat codes. The, the cheat codes are to go into the Smalltalk and, and just change it the way you want it. Yeah. Let's do one more. Um, 2.9 K 
Kai has done a pretty smart little gallery. Let's try Kai. Kai's smart gallery dot one dot image. Hello. Oh, okay. There's a workspace that uh, gives me a hint how to create new worlds if I wanted to make a brand new one of these. Well, that's kind of neat. Virgil, would you display all your horrible images in a gallery like this? Yes, he would. Okay, good. Because that's what me and Ryan were actually working on is some scripts that would like mathematically lay out an array of walls and put directories of images up on them and Maybe in a little while we'll actually have something like that. You saw my rendering got really stuck back there. This thing is spinning. No, it wasn't. Something's, these things are spinning. Oh, well. Neat and artsy. I'm, I'm glad to see this because when you, when you look at my um, stuff, it's just very Gibson-esque, just crystals and boxes and Chinese viruses and visas and stuff like that. Um, and the final one was named... 2.9.lounge.image. Yeah. So this is pretty. There. Nice dolphin. Oh, and this is cool. I like this. From There's a certain distance where you see these two things sticking up, and one looks like a rose, and the other looks like a rose. And you get up closer, and you find it's a dart in a slice of pizza in a pizza box. And I think that's pretty. And I think that's pot. I'm not sure. I'm going <laughs> to push it off. The, the the title of this talk is How I Learned to Quit HTMLing and, and Pass the Virtual Joint because uh, I really like the idea of sitting around a campfire with a bunch of friends at night, like diddling with stuff. Like we had fun diddling at the table here for a while. Um, show you a little bit of small talk in the last two minutes of the talk. Uh, let's get a coupon. And actually, we don't even need the coupon. I'm going to make it go away, and I'll show you the the Smalltalk browser. Alt B. Um, maximize this. Maximize that. And all the classes I added in a new category: Croquet Q. Um, these are categories of classes, and these are classes like my coupon. These are categories of methods, and these are methods, like initialize default space. And I didn't bother categorizing my methods. I was a little lazy there. But uh, to, to make my whole QPOT uh, Quidditch game, we make a floor. We I don't know what this is. Make a pop-up space. Uh, I think that's some kind of pop-up menus. Um, the, the pitch is actually the playing field. And we make it with meta so that everybody gets a replicated copy of the same pitch. And uh, then I adjust the floor because their floor is four units below the origin, and I wanted it right at the origin. My pitch has uh, these little methods you can figure out. The ball comes out every 1.3 seconds. Uh, this is the direction it goes. You could, you could change the direction. It comes out of the cannon. The length of the pitch, 99 balls. You can make it more or less when you're debugging. And... A cannon is a subclass of a T group because a cannon has several different things. Uh, it has a well, back pointer to the pitch that it's in. It has an array of all the balls, all 99 balls. Um, and where's the contents of the cannon? I, I guess I didn't save a, a pointer to it, but the activator is a T cube. That's the little gold cube that we click on that, that causes the cannons to work. And here's the balls that come out. A ball is a T group, and it has a contents. And for the instance of the contents, I put a crude sphere. A crude sphere is just like a T sphere, except when I initialize it, I set the number of segments to four. It was 10 otherwise. So this means it's like a 16 cells or 32 triangles instead of 200 triangles, instead of a 10 by 10 structure to it. And that's why they look pretty crude when you looked at it through the, uh, the view. And I think my time's about up. I made my own kind of dragger because I didn't like the... I wanted you not to have to push shift, shift to push the carpets around. And the thing I inherited it from had it the other way around. 
I made my own future messages. It says, send this message to this receiver with these arguments at this time. And I have a, a sorted list that um, it has a sorted collection that's sorted by the time the messages have to be executed. So when you're creating things, they go into there. I should not have done this, but I kind of did this in the extreme programming way. It's small and simple. I made it work. I need to figure out how to migrate it and use the, the native mechanisms that are built into Quidditch for that. Compute collision with ball. Here's my physics engine. Um, yeah. The, it's broken, Ryan points out. Actually, Ryan has made great advances towards fixing it. Uh, the trick that I've done is I want to know this ball is moving at this speed. It's at this point at this time. Which carpet is it going to hit next? And what I do is for every carpet, I map the ball's position into the local coordinates of the carpet because the carpet lives in a very nice z equals zero plane. It has x and it has y, but in its local dimensions, it's not weird. And so I save myself having to do a lot of dot products and stuff later on down in here by doing everything in the local coordinates of the, of the carpets. Now, I also have to get the ball's velocity in the local terms of the carpet. But once I do that, if the carpet's in z equals zero, I just look at the z component of the position of the ball and the z component of the velocity of the ball, and then I can see if it's going to hit the carpet or if it's going away from the carpet. And real easy to figure out when. So that was my uh, going back to first principles and, and figuring things out. There's a lot to be optimized there. And here's, here's the bug. You can go home and fix it. The bug is when a ball hits one carpet and bounces off of it, at that moment, it figures out what the next carpet it's going to hit is. Now, you may move that carpet, but it's going to bounce when it hits there and then figure out where it's going next. And I did that rather than constantly figuring out throughout the thing when carpets move what, what it's going to hit next. And that was cheating. It turned out it was playable, and we had a lot of fun, and it was good enough, and uh, I, never, I never fixed it. But uh, coming up with a good fix that, that is actually accurate and is simulated the same across all nodes so that how often you, 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 you re-render on each CPU doesn't matter. It's a neat little puzzle. I've got disks. Thank you. Um, we'll probably be around in the, in the hack room down in the basement. Two more things. I lost a digital camera. I think I left it under a chair over there uh, last night. I haven't seen Dolomite today, I don't think. Anyway, if anyone knows someone... Nobody's turned anything in. I might have lost a digital camera. Anyway, if anyone knows anything about it, I'd love to have it back. It's about five years old. Um, it's a Canon... No, no. What is it? Ny Nikon Coolpix 950 in a, in, a, in, a, in a brown bag. Also, Virgil is going to replay his talk at midnight down in the hack room, down in the gaming room at midnight. So if you didn't get to see Virgil... Uh, yesterday, or if you want to like pester him and ask him a lot more questions and hassle him, tonight's the time. It was a good talk. All right, thank you very much, Rattle. Okay.